As we prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning, let us come before God in prayer. Please pray with me. God of the ages, may the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth be acceptable and pleasing to you, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 24. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become wealthy. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female slaves, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old, and he has given him all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I live, but you shall go to my father's house, to my kindred, and get a wife for my son. I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you will only make successful the way I am going, I am standing here by the spring of water. Let the young woman who comes out to draw, to whom I shall say, please give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will say to me, drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming out with her water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew. I said to her, please let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will also water your camels. So I drank, and she also watered the camels. Then I asked her, whose daughter, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to obtain the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you will deal loyally and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, so that I may turn either to the right hand or to the left hand. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will. So they sent away their sister Rebekah and her nurse, along with Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, May you, our sister, become thousands of myriads. May your offspring gain possession of the gates of their foes. Then Rebekah and her maids rose up, mounted the camels, and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had come from Beer Laharoi and was settled in the Negeb. Isaac went out in the evening to walk in the field, and looking up, he saw the camels coming. And Rebekah looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she slipped quickly from the camel and said to the servant, Who is the man over there walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done, then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 11. To what will I compare this generation? It's like a child sitting in the marketplaces calling out to others, we played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We sang a funeral song and you didn't mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he is a demon. Yet the human one came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunk, 
and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved to be right by her works. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Abba, creator of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have shown them to babies. Indeed, God, this brings you happiness. The Almighty One has handed all things over to me. No one knows the Son except the Creator. And no one knows the Creator except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wants to reveal him. Come to me, all of you who are struggling hard and carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Put on my yoke and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble, and you will find rest for yourselves. My yoke is easy to bear, and my burden is light. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to When I was in college, I faithfully went with my friends every Friday night and did contra dancing. If you're not familiar with contra dancing, it is in the same vein as square dancing, live music with a caller. Wikipedia describes contra dancing as a social dance that one can attend without a partner. Dancers form couples, and the couples form sets in long lines, starting at the stage and then going down the length of the dance hall. My friends and I would go as a big group, and I was always the lead in my couple. I would mark this designation by putting on a tie. For you see, there was always a table that was filled with ties. I would swing my partner, and I would do -si do like a professional. When the caller would call out the next move, boy howdy, I was ready to go. I lead my partner making sure we were gallivanting the correct way and listening attentively for the next call. This memory still brings me joy and excitement. But fast forward years later and the random occasion that I have for dancing between Cal and I, well, I still step on his toes. You see, there's confusion in my being on whether I'm the one leading or the one following. Having been the leader, my subconscious has yet to understand that maybe I'm supposed to follow when dancing with Cal. Rebecca, as well as Abraham's servant, whom some say could be Eleazar, are in a similar predicament. You see, this account of Rebecca and her marriage to Isaac is tricky. Is God leading the characters, or are the characters leading themselves? The faith illustrated in this tale does not fit easily into a formula. God's presence is not easily identified. It is the action of the individuals that moves the story along. From the story from the servant hoping to find the right woman for Isaac, to Rebecca changing everything she knows in less than a day. God's presence is somewhere in the story. However, it's not made abundantly clear. On first glance, these characters' faith might be viewed as pedestrian or simple. The servant's faith is one that seems along the lines of wishing for something to happen. But upon closer look, the faith that these characters exhibit is robust and deep. Walter Brueggemann says that the text nurtures a mature faith, a faith that resists romanticism and cynicism. Thus, the listening community can sing about the one who leads, even when we seem to be walking of our own accord. Mature faith is not easy to understand, but it's through faith we can retrospectively see that God's presence has always been near this is the case for the characters in the story. There is a need to look at the larger storyline to see how God is moving. Taking a step back from the narrative of Rebecca and her marriage to Isaac is the greater story of Israel and the promise God has made to Abraham. A couple weeks ago, Patrick preached on the covenantal promise God made with Abram. We've got evidence of it right here in the sanctuary. 
Abram's descendants would be like the number of stars in the sky. And the unfolding of Abraham's life, after receiving this promise from God, he finally has a son. But in order for God's promise to manifest, the son must have offspring. And in order to have offspring, the son must have a mother for his children. At this point in Abraham's life, Sarah, his wife, Isaac's mother, has just passed away. Abraham is beyond old, and Isaac still does not have a partner. It's imperative that Isaac find someone before his father dies so that the blessing can be passed on. One summary of this story says, this is about God's providence as it relates to the fulfillment of God's plan for Abraham, the nation of Israel, the Messiah, and the salvation of the human race. Isaac must have a wife if God's plan is to be fulfilled. Sarah's empty tent must have a woman to carry on the legacy. God's hand is at play in this story. The right woman is identified, and it's through the seemingly simple prayer of the servant and the humongous courage of Rebecca that God's story continues. Abraham's servant Eleazar goes out and tries to find the one who will continue the covenantal promise of God. Now, how might one go about finding the right person to further the story of Israel, the story of God's people? Let's talk about what a huge undertaking that might have been. The prayer Abraham's emissary makes to God that the woman will offer to water the camels is a clever way of finding someone with compassion. It's a clever way of determining if someone might fill the immense role God has in store. Now, the story of the servant and Rebecca is an old story. It's a story that's been passed down through oral tradition. It's a story that was eventually written down by human hands. Throughout all of its tellings, it was inspired by God. This story is situated within a particular context, and contains literary elements that were pertinent to its time. For instance, in Genesis alone, there are four accounts of men meeting wives by watering holes. The women's commentary says, the associations and literature between fertility and water are ancient intuitive acknowledgments of our watery origins on earth and in our mother's wombs. And of, the wa and of the source of life upon which we continue to depend. When Abraham's servant sees Rebekah and listens to her words, he knows that she is the sign requested of God, so that he might recognize the right wife for Abraham's son. God's control is certain and appears in the repetitious language of traditional literature. Rebekah is described as beautiful, untouched woman, quick to serve and nurture and quick to agree in fulfilling her role in the divine plan. When it comes to approaching scripture, extra emphasis on tricky and difficult scripture, the reader is the one who ultimately makes the interpretation. In order to get to the interpretation, though, one must first approach the text with reverence and allow the Holy Spirit to articulate truth. This is how you allow the word of God to come alive. When reading this story, the prevalence of racism, sexism, patriarchy, just to name a few, are nauseating. Remember the history and context of this story, though, helps to pull back some of the layers, these layers that might inhibit where you might see God. When you get to the core of what is happening, one can see God at work in my interpretation, which may very well be different than yours, I have found a claim. Mature faith is not easy to understand, but it's through faith that we can retrospectively see that God's presence has always been near. For my own faith story, I have found myself in many situations where I have paved my own path. I have led because I did not hear a booming voice from God, I faithfully followed the path that was before me. 
For instance, after finishing college and teaching for a couple of years, I was certain that God was calling me to move to Germany. Right before I went on my preview trip to see if this was indeed the place I was supposed to go, I met this guy by the name of Cal. While dating Cal, I attempted to fundraise enough money to go and do ministry in Starnberg, which is right outside of Munich. After quitting my job, fundraising full time, putting my life on hold and getting no closer to deploying, I felt like a failure. This plan, my plan, was not coming to fruition. So it was with a heavy heart that I chose to follow a different path. It was not until the Germany chapter of my life was finished that I was able to see where God was in the midst of my story, that the Germany chapter was part of God's greater narrative for my life. God was in the story the whole time. The chapter just had a different ending. The weaving path that I thought I knew was a path that I, the weaving path that I thought I knew that I was following took me places I had not anticipated. And it's in looking back on that time in my life that I can see where God was in the midst. I learned incredible things about myself, my love for ministry, my love for Cal. God's presence was there the whole time. It just took me being out of that chapter to recognize that wherever I might lead, God will always be near. There's an expression that goes, hindsight is 2020. I find that sometimes to be true and sometimes not. But when it comes to faith, it can be helpful to look and see where God was present in the story, in your own story. For Rebecca and Abraham's servant, there is clarity through the larger narrative. Their stories play into the continuation of God's promise to Israel. In seminary, I read a book about preaching by Unju Mary Kim. And in her introduction, she makes a statement about God. She says, God does not speak uniformly to all circumstances, but accommodates according to various situations and capacities of human comprehension. In order to communicate effectively with human beings, God condescends humbles and accommodates God's self to human categories of thought, experience, and speech. God does not speak to us in the same way. God does not work in our lives in the same way. What is universal is that God works in each one of our lives. Though it may feel as though we are the ones that are leading, God's presence stays with us. Mature faith is not easy to understand, but it's through faith we can see that God's presence has always been near. When we read the news about another victim of gun violence or another demonstration of racism, we might feel as though God's presence is missing. We often feel bogged down with the heinousness of society, and it might seem as though we must forge on to create a better world because God's presence feels absent. But in reality, God is at work. God is at work through each one of our lives. Last weekend, we were at Montreat at the All Church Retreat. And our speaker, Jeannie DeBose, shared with us about our own stories. She shared about how our story is a continuation of God's story. The lives we live continue to reveal God's narrative. The faith of Rebecca and Abraham's servant is a faith that illustrates God's presence. Even though the characters are the ones that are leading, their lives demonstrate a mature faith that trust that the divine nature of God is at work. If we go back to talking about contradancing, the question was, do we lead or do we follow? Being new here to Asheville, I've been doing some exploring about contradancing, and I've discovered that since my college days, they've changed the way they do things. They no longer have a table with ties anymore. Instead, they have a button. They have buttons that say, I dance both roles. 
And thinking about this story and remembering that in our own faith journeys, we lead and we follow, it might be helpful to think about these buttons. We dance both roles. We lead and we follow. And God is always part of our dance. Mature faith is not easy to understand, but it's through faith that we can see that God is ever-present. May you experience that to be true today and always. Amen.